I'm getting a signal to go, right? This means you start. Yeah, okay. So do we have a recitation of Friday? Yes? Yes. So we have a recitation of Friday. Okay. Uh, the homework is not very difficult, but uh, there's a lot of stuff in the homework. Okay. A lot of stuff. Uh, it's mostly for learning purposes because a lot of the algorithms you can find them, but you need to understand what these uh, uh, algorithms are all about. All right, so we have to continue today on uh, uh, expectation maximization. The lecture that I posted for uh, last Monday contains many topics that uh, in many ways are research relevant. So those topics I have no time to cover in this course. I will leave those slides up. So actually the slides today, it's a minimalist view of the slides from Monday. Okay, so if you want more details, you go to the lecture on, uh, on Monday. Uh, so some of the topics from Monday that will not be covered today, we will cover them in some way or another next uh, semester, okay? Uh, if you stick around. Okay, so I have uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different little topics to discuss, uh, starting with uh, uh, a review of what we were discussing on uh, uh, Gaussian mixture so that uh, uh, everybody is uh, up to speed here. So remind me, so you know we introduce uh, for every data point effectively x we introduce uh, the latent variable z, okay? Uh, and uh, this was shown to basically simplify the calculations we did for Gaussian mixtures and we will review some of that today. And uh, so that's the posterior distribution of the latent variables. And rather than playing with uh, the uh, likelihood of the observed data x, we now we did some work with the augmented likelihood of x and z, even though z is not observed. Okay. So the idea was if we had x, and, uh, if we had z observed in addition to x, uh, we form this joint log likelihood, and the EM algorithm. Uh, is based basically on calculations uh, uh, using uh, uh, using this entity here. Okay, so remind me what are the posterior responsibilities? So for every data point n, what is uh, bless you? Uh, what is what are the posterior responsibilities? So uh, I gave you the name the the symbol we used before. We call those gamma. Um, it says here it's equal to the expect expected value of z, and I actually remind you that this is also equal to the probability of uh, uh, z and k given what? This is, what is the responsibility, the posterior responsibility? So, uh, I mean, I can call this gamma n k, right, like, right? Uh, so what is the posterior responsibility for data point n? What, what's the meaning? You see what happens when you don't give homework, nobody pays any attention, you know, it's like I'm all over the space uh, and it's like, what? So what's the posterior responsibility, the English? Uh, it has nothing to do with mathematics. So for data point n, what is the posterior responsibility that you see here? Is the probability that uh, the point n belongs to what cluster? To the cluster k, that's it. And that's why I said that this is uh, equal to the probability because this is a binary variable, right? So it's one and zero. Uh, so the expectation is the same as the probability of uh, z and k being equal to one. Are you spaced out? No? All right. Okay. So in... Uh, 
basically the first step of the EM algorithm, what we have to do is we have to calculate the posterior of the hidden uh, variables. And in the case of the Gaussian mixtures, for each data point, basically we have to compute uh, these uh, posterior responsibilities. Okay. Once we had uh, that, then we form the uh, join log like equal of x and z, and uh, even further than that, we took the expectation of that with respect to what? So this is the expectation of the join log likelihood with respect to what distribution? I mean, what is the only way you can get uh, the posterior responsibilities there, uh, here? These are the expectations with respect to? If you don't take expectations, uh, what will you have here when you take the joint of likelihood? Instead of this gamma, what do you have? You remember the form of this uh, joint of likelihood, how it was written? I don't want to recycle the previous slides because they are 180 and we're not going to move an inch basically today. Okay? So, uh, what did I have here without taking any expectation? when you just write the join log likelihood. Yeah. One over n, not one over n. I mean, you remember even the prior, right? Uh, everything is written as pi k to z and k, you remember? And this was n to z and k, where z and k can be one or zero. So when you take logs, what do you have here? Yeah, so what do you get there? I know, but what is this variable instead of gamma if you don't, before you take expectations, what do you have here? Z and K, thank you. So you have Z and K, and then what you do is, if you take the, pos the expectation of this joint log likelihood with respect to this posterior, and that will give you basically the expectation of Z and K, which we call uh, I mean, this is the notation Bishop is using for Gaussian mixtures, we call this the posterior responsibilities. Actually, you know, if you don't like this notation because it doesn't generalize well to other problems, what you can do is instead of uh, gamma, you just write explicitly the expectation of Z and K. Okay? And the expectation of Z and K again is the posterior probability of Z and K becoming equal to 1, right? Because Z and K is a binary value. So, um, and of course, you know, when we discuss about this uh, joint log likelihood, we, uh, you know, introduce the major advantage, basically, of working with the joint of X and Z from the fact that we don't have log uh, inside the log having some summation uh, over, the, uh, over this uh, K. So the both summations here are outside, okay? Uh, so we have basically a very nice form to do calculations, but of course Z is not known and that's why the expectation maximization algorithm is iterative. So in the first step you will assume all the parameters like mu and sigma, compute the posterior responsibilities, and once you compute that, uh, come here and then maximize this with respect to the parameters, and the parameters are the mixing coefficients, the means, and the variance. Okay, so in, in many ways, the M step is uh, uh, an MLE estimate uh, for the, uh, you know, the joint log likelihood. And as we will see, basically, you can easily make this uh, MLE estimate to move to and become uh, a map estimate. I think if I have time, I will discuss that today. Okay, so this is nothing there, uh, Neil. Um, can you give me? Um, so, okay, so this is what I was talking before, right? If you form the joint, this is how it looks like. The Z and K is on the exponent. So when you take logs, you get Z and K on the front, and the only thing you have to take uh, is expectation of Z and K because the rest of the variables don't depend on the latent uh, variable Z. So I have three pictures here just to remind you of what we were discussing last week. Can you tell me what's the picture in the middle? 
So all the points with, with the same color, which means we have no idea from where they came from. All right? Uh, what is this pixel here? The original Gaussians, exactly. That is basically how I generated the data. All right? So when I generated this, I generate them from the red Gaussian, this is the green Gaussian, and this is the blue Gaussian. And uh, uh, this is what the EM algorithm will uh, do for me if I try to fit a mixture of three Gaussians. It will give me basically the three uh, components in the mixture, but you notice the points in between uh, each of the components, they are not uh, uh, one simple color, but they are a mixture of colors, and this mixture is defined by this posterior responsibility. Okay, uh, and as I told you, you should uh, uh, try to learn how to to mark points in uh, MATLAB, you know, with uh, uh, three colors or four colors at the same time. So that way, you can impress your advisor. Though at least you're not color blind. It will not work for me, of course, right, for obvious reasons, uh, because I'm, I have hard time with. Uh, with lots of colors. Okay, so um, now in the M step, if you take derivatives with respect to pi, mu, and sigma, so if you differentiate this and set the derivatives equal to zero, uh, these are the uh, estimates that you get for um, the, the centers of the Gaussians, the means, the variances, and these are the, the mixing coefficients, okay? And what is important, and I may come back to this, is you notice that the uh, this uh, uh, expected sufficient statistics, basically, they are uh, uh, building inside this NK and inside uh, effectively this term here that you see. Actually, I mean, I can see, let's see, um, we also need this uh, this gamma times xn, xn transpose as well, okay? But, you know, let's concentrate on, on, uh, on uh, so remind me, what's nk? So when you sum over all uh, n's, these uh, gamma z and k's, uh, over all n's, over all data points, what's nk? It's the effective number of points in cluster k, okay? Uh, so th this is effectively easily you know, you, because this is, it looks like MLE, right? You know, if it was MLE, let's say for Gaussian, what you would do is take all the points and divide by n, but now if you take all the points weighted, but what percentage of these points belongs to the cluster K? I mean, it makes sense, right? Because some of these, they're not equal to one, they're maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So you weight all the points XN, this is important, not just the ones that, uh, you notice there's K here, you weight all, but with the responsibilities that belong to the cluster K, and then you divide by the effective number of the points uh, that belong in cluster K. So actually one of the things, uh, again, if I have time, otherwise you will read it in the notes, you can uh, do this algorithm sequentially. So effectively, you don't have to go and compute all the responsibilities for all the points set. So the most effective thing to do is, you know, Take its data point, or you can do this even randomly, and compute the essential sufficient statistics for, co for the evaluation of mu, sigma, and, and uh, pi, and effectively update this, uh, you know, write these equations in a sequential form as you compute the responsibilities for one data point at a time. Okay? And, uh, and the reason you want to do this one data point at a time, it is very possible these values will converge. Uh, way before you go through all the data points, okay? So this would be a way more efficient way to implement uh, EM. Uh, the differentiation of this with respect to the parameters is straightforward. The only thing uh, uh, you should remember is when you take derivatives with respect to pi, right? You should also put a Lagrange uh, multiplier there that the sum of all the pi k's is equal to one. I mean, there's nothing else really. That's a, sort of a standard uh, type of calculation. Um, I don't have time to go through that. Don't have time to go through that. Okay. Um, let me see, so we cover one topic.
I need to be sure I go through the uh, the uh, the topics in some uh, importance here. So let me. Uh, I'm going to do some jumping. Okay. All right. So let me jump to. Come on. You see the mouse anywhere? Where is it? Yeah. How is there any way I can go full screen on this without um, because the mouse doesn't show? Say it again. Alt F. Uh, what is the tab symbol? Alt oh, tab. This one? No. This didn't help me. Get that in the PDF. Okay. Now I see the mouse. So we that helped. All right. So um, let's discuss. Uh, um, a generalization of the AM algorithm to be sure that uh, we have time to to cover this topic because in essence this topic it's an introduction to variation methods in machine learning so it's a topic that uh, uh, you really need to know okay so there will be nothing really new the notation may look slightly different and there will be no Gaussian mixtures or anything like that it will be a little bit more general so the problem uh, in your mind, basically, you can think of Gaussian mixtures, right? But it's way much more uh, general the way that we will present it. So we have some observed variables x, OK? And uh, z are uh, some uh, latent variables, OK? Um, this can be applicable to hundreds of different type of problems. Model reduction, basically, so z can be a low dimensional representation of the x. That, uh, maps to x basically through some nonlinear mapping to be learned uh, uh, can be our mixture models etc etc okay so x observed z latent uh, these are the set of parameters in whatever model we're going to to work with so exactly as in uh, the uh, mixture model i mean the bottom line is we really want to maximize the evidence of the data so we need to find the parameters that maximize this this likelihood, but because this is not very tractable to do calculations with, as it was the case with the Gaussian mixture, we're basically going to introduce the joint, okay? And the joint, basically, you can see uh, uh, the definition there. But effectively, we're going to try to do calculations for this uh, uh, joint data log likelihood. So here is an important identity uh, before uh, I proceed, you know, with. Uh, uh, with uh, generalization of the EM algorithm. So introduce any arbitrary distribution on uh, the latent variables. And when I mean arbitrary, anything. Okay? So Q of Z can be Gaussian, can be a mixture of Gaussian. So in principle right now, it's an arbitrary distribution. It has nothing to do with anything. But I can tell you, the objective actually will be this arbitrary distribution to approximate the posterior, so the posterior distribution of the latent variable z. So the idea is we don't really know the posterior of z, so we're going to try to approximate it, uh, start with some arbitrary q of z that somehow will converge to the true posterior of z. Okay? So what I mean arbitrary, uh, whatever the questions I'm going to give you are arbitrary, but we want somehow to maximize that, and we will see that uh, in the calculations, this will convert to the posterior uh, of Z given our data set uh, X. So the following uh, identity is uh, fundamental to variational methods. So let's see what it says. It says the log of the uh, data uh, uh, likelihood is equal to this, uh, what is called the lower bound, uh, that is a function of Q and theta. And at this stage, remember, Q is arbitrary, plus the kulbach liebler distance between Q and the posterior uh, of Z, given the data X. So look at it carefully, right? And I will prove it. And the proof is one line, OK? Now, I do believe that all of you, you forgot what the kulbach liebler distance is, correct? All right. Uh, so I remind you. Uh, it's sort of a pseudo distance between, uh, so if you are interested in some uh, measure of the distance between two 
distributions, uh, Q and P. Uh, this is the definition basically of the KL distance. And in, this, in our problem for this equality, we hold P is the posterior of Z given X. Okay? I remind you, um, by the way, pay attention to the form of this um, uh, where Q comes with a minus sign because there is the reverse distance, the distance between P and Q, and uh, KL is not symmetric. Okay? So actually, you know, uh, next semester, you know, we will uh, explore this uh, uh, while doing inference, basically, in complicated problems or uh, in, uh, in a graph theoretic way. But right now, the distance between Q and P is given like that. And I remind you a few uh, fundamental things. The KL distance is greater or equal to zero, and it's only zero if Q is equal to the posterior of Z given X. So hopefully you can see where I am going, right? The idea would be somehow uh, if we minimize this distance, we're going to be making Q to be close to basically to be the posterior of Z given X, right? Uh, and the minimizer of this will give us a value Z for, I mean, a value zero for this KL distance. And effectively, uh, the lower bound that you see here all right, I'm going to prove this, it will be uh, equal to the actual log likelihood, all right? So effectively, if um, uh, we want to maximize this, we can optimize instead this lower bound because uh, if you look at the right-hand side, because the KL distance is positive or equal to zero, this is greater or equal to this lower bound. So if you really want to maximize this, you maximize that. And uh, you may say, and who cares? Why I cannot do it right here? And, and I introduce this weird thing. Well, you want to maximize this instead of that, because look at that. In the definition of this lower bound, you have the joint log likelihood of X and Z. And we already have discussed that that's computationally much more profitable to work with rather than uh, working with uh, uh, the uh, likelihood of X. OK? So let's prove this for in one line for any arbitrary Q uh, of Z. So here's, well, I said one line. Um, I enlarge it, but you know, if you write it on a piece of paper, it will come up to be one line, OK? So let's read uh, fast. This is the definition, OK? So this is, I split the log in two terms, all right? So I, one equation. Um, now I have the joint of uh, X and Z, so I can write this as the condition of Z given X plus uh, the likelihood of X, all right? And these are logs. So this I split in two terms, minus this, okay? Uh, Q times this, nice. Uh, this does not depend on Z, so I put it outside the integral, and integral of Q of Z dz is equal to 1. I mean, it's a value distribution. So I get this minus this. By the way, does this remind you anything? Q log of Q, what does that remind you? Entropy, right? OK. Uh, so it reminds us of entropy. OK. Uh, so I have this plus this minus that. Uh, so uh, what I do is I bring this term uh, in here. And I have Q and Q, all right? So this will give me minus Q log of Q plus log of that. Uh, so I have log of the, uh, the log likelihood. And this is uh, minus the KL distance between Q and P. So basically, the equation we had before was proved now. The log likelihood is the lower bound plus the KL distance, all right? So the same equation is basically written again here. Uh, for any Q, the log likelihood is this lower bound plus the KL distance between Q and P. And again, I call this a lower bound because this is greater or equal to zero. So you can see this calligraphic L is the lower bound to the likelihood. So the idea here is if you somehow uh, you manage to, uh, to work on this uh, lower bound and you maximize it, then uh, uh, you basically reach the maximum of the uh, of the log likelihood, which is the original problem. 
All right, so I'm going to give you a graphical representation that uh, uh, hopefully will make a, a sense. And effectively, the graphical representation will be the generic representation of the EM algorithm. Okay? So, uh, and think of the EM algorithm in the context of uh, Gaussian mixtures to start with, but uh, the presentation is, uh, has nothing to do with mixtures, it's very general. Okay? So, here is the uh, log likelihood. This is what we want to maximize, right? And uh, uh, this is the zero line, and we want to go as high up as possible, so we want to compute effectively the parameters that maximize the log likelihood. And we just prove that this is equal to this lower bound uh, plus the scale distance. Okay? So obviously, when the scale distance is zero, uh, then the lower bound uh, becomes equal to the log likelihood, so we are effectively uh, uh, done. Okay? So let's see how we're going to do this. All right. So remember. Uh, can you remind me what's the east step in the EM algorithm? What do we do in the east step? Again, in the context of Gaussian mixtures, but we will generalize here, of course. So what was the east step? What do we do to the parameters theta in the east step? So the parameters theta, right, like the mean, the variance, the pi coefficients, we keep them fixed. Okay? Uh, and then we compute the posterior of Z, alright, using the old parameters. And then we took the expectation of that. That's what gave us the, the responsibilities. Do you remember? Okay. So what we have to do is uh, we are going to keep the parameters constant on the east step, okay? And, uh, you know, we w are interested to compute the posterior of Z, which in our case means we're interested to compute uh, uh, this approximate expression, this Q of Z, uh, all right? Uh, and obviously, if I keep the parameters theta old uh, fixed, the optimal Q of Z, all right, that... Uh, uh, will bring me as close to as you know as possible to the uh, uh, log likelihood will be uh, the Q that minimizes the distance between Q and P, and that Q is this, right? So let me repeat: uh, in the uh, E step, we keep theta all fixed, all right? So theta all fixed. You know what it means? This red line is fixed. It's not going to move. So we want basically, uh, you know, we want to find a Q that will bring us, uh, will give us, will bring basically the lower bound to be equal to this distance from this dark line uh, to the red line on the top. Okay? And this to happen, the, uh, the distance between Q and P has to be zero. You remember the distance between uh, the KL distance between Q and this posterior is this distance here. So effectively what we have to do is minimize the KL distance, which means this, right? And that will bring this dotted line that defines the lower bound to, to the top blue line, and it will make the lower bound equal to uh, the uh, log likelihood but the log likelihood is computed with the old parameters. Makes a little bit of sense, right? So again, uh, in the east step, um, we come up with the optimal approximation for Q, which is equal to the posterior of Z, where the parameters are kept at their own values, theta old. Uh, that will minimize the KL distance and will bring the lower bound uh, basically to the top here, and it will make the lower bound equal to the actual uh, log likelihood, but with parameters kept at theta all. Okay, so we have not updated the parameters yet. Okay, uh, now it is part obviously the uh, expectation step, because at the end, once we compute Q, uh, which is this, what we do is we calculate 
uh, when we did the Gaussian mixture, we calculated the expected value of the joint log likelihood. All right? So here there is no, we're not going to calculate the expected value of the joint log likelihood. We are going to calculate the lower bound L, and the lower bound by definition is this. So I want you to look at it and tell me, does it relate at all with the uh, expected uh, joint log likelihood? Do you see any relation of this with what we did for the mixture model? Is there anything here that reminds you the expected uh, joint log likelihood of X and Z? Do you see anything like that? For example, if I take uh, this and the log on the top, what is that term? And the summation in Z, of course, or integral in Z, if Z is continuous. So what is that term uh, will give me? It will be, so that thing will be basically what we had before with that quantity Q is the expected joint log likelihood where there was a gamma there, and then we had summations of over data points. But we had the joint log likelihood there before. OK, the likelihood of x and z. So you can immediately see that the lower bound is really like what we did for the Gaussian mixture. The only difference is there is an entropy-like term on the uh, bottom all right, that does not depend on theta. So when we do the maximization step, we will not contribute anything. Okay, so uh, this uh, term you need it so that you keep basically the equality that we presented in place. Uh, but effectively, this is really the expected value of the joint log likelihood, the log likelihood of X and Z, right? Uh, but so pay attention. The the expectation is with respect to the uh, approximate posterior for the parameters are kept uh, to the all values. But the log likelihood is with respect to the unknown parameters theta that we're going to update. It's very uh, important here. OK? So uh, you remember in the E step? In the E step, we approximated Q of Z equal to this. And we uh, basically, we brought this uh, dotted blue line up to the top. OK? And now we take an expectation. But this Q here that we take expectation with has the old parameters. But the joint log likelihood is the new parameter state. Right? I mean, if I put there theta all, there's no way I can uh, have any equation that will allow me to compute the new part of the parameter stop data. All right? Um, so, so in uh, at, when I finish the step, right, after I computed uh, this responsibility-like uh, uh, entities, because you remember the posterior probability of Z, right? It is the expected value of Z. It is the, uh, the posterior responsibility that we saw them before. But right now, I write it explicitly as probability, so you can actually see that this is the expected value of this log, join log likelihood there, OK? This gives me an expectation of the log of P of X and Z. Uh, for uh, arbitrary parameters theta. All right, so let's see this uh, graphically. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, the M step, we want to maximize this, right? We want to maximize. OK. Uh, so effectively, we want to go from theta on to theta new. So let's say uh, that the this was the line that we had before to define the log likelihood for the old parameters. So now we are going to update the parameters, which means we're going to increase the likelihood of the data. So we're going to move from this dotted line up there. All right? Now, is the distance now between KL, the KL distance between Q and P going to be 0 or not? And why it cannot be 0? Do I optimize uh, Q in, uh, in uh, uh, do I play with this posterior in, uh, uh, in the M step? Do I touch Q at all in the M step? Do I touch uh, this thing at all in the M step?
Yeah, but we don't, uh, you remember in the M step, we are going to optimize with respect to the parameters, right? So we can increase the likelihood. This is our Q. Do we touch our old Q? Can we do anything to it? Of course not. Why? Because that Q depends on the old parameters. So obviously, uh, even though the log likelihood will increase, there will always be some distance between Q and P that is non zero on the M step. Okay? And uh, which means, yes, in the M step, by selecting the parameters, if, by moving them from theta all to theta nu, this lower bound will increase, but it cannot increase as much as the log likelihood will increase because there will always be this gap there. Okay? So, uh, obviously, that's the M step, all right? And you will iterate the two steps until basically, uh, you know, uh, you find the maximum of the log likelihood, so you find the parameters that maximize the log of P of X. I am going to give you, uh, uh, all right, so we we'll discussed about all of this. Uh, I know they didn't make a lot of sense because uh, everybody's looking at me like it's Friday. So let me uh, give you a graphical representation of what's going on and maybe this can help, okay? So let's say that, uh, uh, not that we would know that this red line is the exact uh, log likelihood. So you know, if you calculate the log likelihood with the exact parameters that you don't know, let's say that you get this uh, complicated red line. Okay, so um, let's start with the A step uh, where the parameters are fixed at theta all. Can you tell me exactly what uh, we are doing with this blue line? What, what is happening at the, um, at the E step? Basically, I repeat what I said before, but in the context of uh, this graph that uh, pictorially tells you what's going on. What did we say happens to the KL distance between Q and P in uh, the E step? Well, it's just as decreasing, we're making it equal to what? Zero. And, uh, and we're making the lower bound equal to the exact log likelihood at that set of parameters. So you notice the, the lower bound, all right, at theta all uh, is at the same value as the actual log likelihood. Okay? And actually, not only they're at the same value, the two curves, the blue and the red, they have the same slope as well. And you know why is that the case? Why the slope is the same? I remind you that the log likelihood is equal to the lower bound plus the KL distance. So why the slope at this point, why the slopes of the two curves are the same? I remind you, the log likelihood equal lower bound plus KL distance. All right, and the KL distance of the point is zero, all right? KL is minimized. KL is minimized. So can you see why the two slopes are the same? What is my uh, fundamental equation? Come on. If I take this equation, right? And you take um, uh, and you take derivatives with respect to theta. So you're going to have the derivative of the log likelihood, the derivative of uh, the lower bound. Uh, and what's the derivative of the KL distance? Uh, it is zero because you are minimizing the, the you know this uh, KL distance. Okay. So uh, so basically so basically at this point the lower bound shares the same value and the slopes are the same. Okay, uh, what is the next step? What do we do in the M step then? We have to update the parameters. So what do we do in the M step? We cannot really drop the KL distance to zero. The, the Q doesn't change. So we have, we have to play with the parameters. And so what do we do in the M step? Maximization step. We maximize what? What do we maximize in the M step? The lower bound. So here is this thing. So what we do is we find that what values of parameters 
uh, this blue curve here, this lower bound, is maximized. And then uh, I'm ready to move to the new step. So my new lower bound will be this green curve, all right, where it shares the same value as the log likelihood at this point on the same slope. Then I will maximize that. I will go there and then keep going until you reach basically the maximum of the log likelihood. Okay. I cannot emphasize how fundamental this algorithm is, right? It comes uh, everywhere, and sometimes, you know, it's in front of you saying use, you know, use EM, but you need to start thinking of uh, your problem in the context of EM. It's not going to be a Gaussian mixture or something else that looks familiar. It may not be familiar at all, okay? Uh, the idea here is, uh, if your log likelihood is complicated, uh, introduce hidden variables that make the joint distribution of action Z easier, and then you have a fundamental in a principal way to maximize the log likelihood by playing with the joint log likelihood. That's the whole idea. Okay. So, um, so the idea here is, you know, if you have a distribution that's very difficult to do computation maybe increasing the space of your variables uh, is a good thing because uh, in the space of X and Z, maybe things look easier. And you say, but I don't care about Z. Yes, you don't care, but do it what you need to do and then get rid of Z. That's exactly what the EM algorithm does. OK? OK. Uh, all right, so we're done with one more topic. Any questions on this? All right, so let me, uh, I'm going to demonstrate to you uh, a problem we have seen in like the first few lectures, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm going to use EM because I told you, you know, you need to be uh, thinking, oh, here it is, all right. Um, so in the lecture notes from uh, Monday, I have a lot of different examples, right? Some of them. Uh, really research oriented but I want to revisit one example uh, that we have seen okay uh, and that has to do with our uh, basic regression Bayesian linear regression model okay uh, and I'm going to convince you that there is uh, uh, a very nice in principle way to compute this hyperparameters alpha and beta and I know you guys forgot everything about alphas and betas and you learned no Greek in my lectures, uh, which is disappointing. So let me just remind you what we have, or you have to remind me. So I, this is our basic, basic uh, regression model. So can you tell me what's going on? What are the three questions? And in particular, what is W, what is alpha and beta? So what's the question on the top? is the likelihood, right? And my regression model, the mean function is W transpose some uh, vector of basis functions of X, right? Remember? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, beta here is the, the precision, the noise uh, in, uh, you know, in, my, in my model. And it is unknown, so we don't know what beta is. So it's the hyperparameter. Then we introduce a prior uh, on uh, uh, the W's, and this parameter alpha was also known, okay? And uh, I remind you that uh, we introduced what's called the evidence approximation, which is sort of uh, another very unifying theme in, uh, in machine learning. If you want to calculate hyperparameters, like in this case alpha and beta, what you need to do is you need to maximize what's called the marginal likelihood or the evidence. So what's the evidence? So T is the, you know, if I am fitting functions, X and Y data, right? T is my Y values, or I X are my uh, X coordinates, let's say. So this is the marginal likelihood. There's no W, right? So this is really the regular likelihood if I knew W times the posterior of W and then averaging over W, okay? So this is this marginal likelihood. 
So I remind you that we discussed in one lecture uh, that uh, a good, once you calculate a posterior of W, uh, to find uh, point estimates of alpha and beta is, uh, uh, is not a bad idea. Maybe you don't need to, to compute the posterior of alpha and beta, or maybe it's difficult to do so. So what you can do is you can use point estimates for alpha and beta, uh, and those point estimates can be computed by maximizing with respect to alpha and beta this marginal active. So um, we developed, you know, we took derivatives, we calculated this whole integral. Uh, we were lucky that this integral was uh, uh, easy to compute. It was coming, I'm assuming, to be a nice expression because uh, this is a Gaussian, this is a Gaussian, when you average, you know, uh, in the grade W, you get a Gaussian. But now I want to use the EM algorithm. So I want you to tell me what the EM algorithm has to do with this problem. Give me some kids. All right, so I want to use the M algorithm. I mean, I, I remind you here, right, that I have not written down the posterior of W, but you will remember the posterior of W depends on alpha and beta. Right? So you can think that W you now becomes what? What variable should we make W to look like so I can apply EM? Latent variable. So I'm gonna make W to be my Z variable. Right? And then my alpha and beta will be my theta uh, power. Alright. If we do that, uh guess so this is the posterior, right? Uh this is from uh, earlier lectures. I just cut and paste. You notice the posterior depends on the alphas and depends on the betas. And it's a nice Gaussian in this case, the trivial model, right? So, um, so obviously, we can find a way where we approximate the posterior. Uh, that would be the each step. And then we maximize the joint log likelihood of W and, and uh, T. Uh, okay, we uh, again we maximize the joint log likelihood. Okay, with respect to the parameters alpha and beta. So what we need to do is, um, since we, you know, if, if I give you, this is not analytically, so you don't have to compute uh, uh, what uh, the posterior of W is. The only thing uh, you just need to remember that in the E step, you will use your previous values of alpha and beta, and then we have to go to the M step. So in the M step, we need the expectation with respect to this posterior, which is, you remember, like our Z variables, of the joint log likelihood of T and W. And you may say it's weird. You know, they have the joint log likelihood of the responses in a regression model and of the parameters. Yeah, why not? You can do anything you want. OK? So I have the joint log likelihood of this. I can approximate this joint log likelihood as uh, uh, the likelihood if I knew W, right? This is Gaussian, okay? Plus basically uh, my the log of my prior so uh, W, which is this, okay? So if uh, uh, you expand this, if you substitute basically with your likelihood and the prior, uh, the only thing that you left is to take expectations with respect to this W fixed at the previous parameters. And the only places that W come is a W transpose W here, so you have to take expectations of this. And there is a W coming inside this uh, uh, error function that tells you how close you're matching the... Uh, I thought maybe uh, ABC News is going to jump in or something like that, you know. Or somebody will bring a bottle of champagne. Okay, but no luck. All right, those things happen. Well, I mean, I was, you know, when I was a student, uh, one day the door opened and a belly dancer came in and some dancer uh, uh, for one of the professors who just enjoyed uh, enormously, but I suppose 
those things will not happen at Notre Day, right? Uh, okay. And I'm on tape too, you know. Okay, so what are we talking here? Uh, we need, you know, every term that has a W, right? We need to take expectations with respect to the posterior of W, and I see here is one term, here is another term. Okay? So, uh, I don't have to tell you, I mean, this is, you know, if you want the expectation of W transpose W, is um, uh, this is not W, W transpose, right? It comes W transpose W. It comes up that is the trace of the posterior variance, and uh, M transpose M, where M is the mean of the posterior. Okay? And similarly, this term, you can compute it. So this is the sufficient, st the, the, sufficient st the expe expected values of the sufficient statistics that you need to find this expectation of the joint log lucky. OK? Uh, we haven't really discussed this too much, but the fact that you know all of these distributions we play with are from the exponential family, they all lead to the to the need to only compute the sufficient, to this expected sufficient statistics, all right? So we don't just, we don't need to compute W transpose W, the expectation of W transpose W. And similarly here, we don't need to compute the square term, but the expectation of that with respect to the posterior of W. So anyways, uh, if you uh, take derivatives now, so you plug in the values that you get for this expectation and this expectation, and um, you take them derivatives with respect to alpha and beta because we need to maximize this with respect to parameters theta, you get the two equations on the bottom, okay? And surprisingly, those two equations are very different from the equations we got when we worked on the evidence approximation where we simply maximize the, uh, the marginal line. All right, so in our early lecture, we maximized this, and we got to take equations for alpha and beta, okay? Uh, I remind you, by the way, the equations we got, they were also iterative in nature. They were not closed form solutions. It was not like alpha equal to that, beta equal to that. We had to iterate, okay? And, and the fact that this is now uh, the EM algorithm obviously tells you there was something there related to this concept of hidden variables that requires these iterations. So anyways, the update for alpha and beta look like that, okay? Uh, and uh, the iterations are needed because basically uh, there is, I mean, if I look at the values of uh, this variance of the mean, most probably there's alpha and beta embedded somewhere there, okay? But they are fixed at the old parameters, okay? So anyways, if you compare this with what we got, uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, the evidence approximation, the equations don't look the same, okay? They look different. So when you read the notes, it actually uh, it shows, uh, I think in the following slide, that when uh, this method converges and when the evidence method, evidence approximation converges, basically they both give you the same consistent uh, value. They converge the same the same action. Okay, so um, so again, you know, uh, regression problem EM. Yes, you know why not? Okay, um, as a matter of fact, if you are, you know, some I think in the slides discuss other applications, including uh, uh, relevant vector machines. I mean, sparse basically regression models. And there you can see that uh, EM is also a very powerful method uh, uh, to show this type of problems. Okay, how are we doing? 425. So let me. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, another example of EM. There are hundreds of those actually, and, uh, but you know, I want to give you examples that. Um, This one is a good example. I mean, I'm going to try to cover everything that's on this slide, okay? So, um, okay. All right. Um, this is an example, actually, I think we have seen 
uh, in an earlier lecture. And potentially, you guys have, did we work in any of the homework problems for uh, the imputation problem for you have a matrix with uh, missing elements? Did we do anything like that? No? But I gave you something to compute the covariance or something. Uh, I forgot. Or it was a math estimate using. Uh, there was something? Okay. All right. So let, let me describe what the problem is. All right. So uh, I'm going to take basically that we have uh, uh, a high dimensional Gauss. You know, so we have data coming from uh, some, some uh, uh, multivariate Gaussian. And uh, we want to find uh, the, uh, the parameters in the Gaussian, right? Uh, but we cannot apply, let's say, MLE estimate or MAP estimate the way I think we did in the homework some time ago, OK? And uh, the reason we cannot apply is uh, that uh, the, uh, some uh, of the information that we need in our data set is missing, OK? So if you put the data uh, matrix down X, it has some holes in it, right? And uh, so what I do is I split the data in two parts. Um, you can think of all the, the data supposed to have XIJ, all right? So X visible are, uh, I denote the, this data with this variable OIJ equal to one. So it tells me basically that I do know um, for data point i, I know the j component because this is multivariate data, okay? And then I have uh, some data I've not known, and I denote this with this variable oij being equal to zero, okay? So what we need to do is we need to find uh, the parameters that maximize uh, the evidence, uh, and the evidence here can only be defined in terms of the visible variables, the ones that I'm giving to you, right? So imagine if you know x is uh, let's say in 20 dimensions. Uh, every other data point I omit some of the dimensions and I don't give them to you. And I say go and get me an MLE estimate or a map estimate of the parameters you know, of the original problem. So uh, this is an ideal sort of a scenario of where uh, uh, the EM algorithm comes to play a role. Because look at this. I mean, I don't have to, time to do all the details, but if you look at the, uh, the this uh, distribution of the visible variables given the parameters, it's really nothing else but it's the marginal of the joint log likelihood that involves the observations and the hidden variables. And the hidden variables in this problem become what variables? What is hidden? What I didn't give uh, to you? So you remember from some of the X data points, I removed some of the, uh, you know, columns. I said these coordinates are going to give them to you. These are the hidden values. Okay? So if I knew them, for each data I, if I knew that, and integrate on X I H, I'm sorry, if I knew that, right, uh, uh, it would be easy to do MLE. Since I don't know them here, I will still work with this joint uh, uh, likelihood, if you like. Uh, that involves both the visible and the hidden variables uh, x i x and uh, by the way you, you you know if you don't do this effectively if you don't use an em algorithm look how complicated it is to work with uh, uh, you you can say well i'm going to go and maximize the likelihood of the observations which are the visible variables but you have this fundamental problem you have log and inside the log you have a summation that's nasty, okay? Uh, log and inside the log you have a summation, so you cannot do that. So can you help me uh, without showing any more slides on how uh, the EM algorithm will work on this problem? What do we need to do? What will be E step involved? Just think of the classical algorithms we presented, and you know what hidden is and what visible is. So what is the E step going to include? We have to find the probability of what? The posterior, basically, of the hidden, given the visibles, for some fixed parameters. So the parameters we don't have to worry. Uh, 
you remember that this comes from a multivariate Gaussian. So if I tell you some of the components are hidden, some are visible, can you find actually the the, the posterior or you know I'm, I'm just going to call it the conditional so you know we can communicate the conditional of the hidden variables given the visible variables do you know how to do this for Gaussian if I give you a multivariate Gaussian can you find the conditional I mean the, uh, yes the conditional of the hidden given the visible the answer is yes and if you find that in the east step what you need to do is you need to take expectations with respect to that posterior right because this is what is going to come to the joint of likelihood and those expectations the sufficient statistics actually will be sufficient statistics for the following uh, will be the expectation of uh, x hidden x hidden transpose and the expectation of uh, uh, x hidden okay and uh, so we will need basically to compute this uh, uh, expected sufficient statistics okay and we can do this uh, because this conditional of the hidden variables given the visible ones is a Gaussian that we have seen in early lectures right and you can write it down uh, in a closed form solution uh, that basically gives you what the mean of the hidden variables is given the visible variables what the variance is okay which means you can actually compute now uh, the sufficient statistics that you need uh, in the joint long likelihood okay uh, and these sufficient statistics are these blue uh, these blue at the values that we see here it is basically the expectation of x hidden x hidden transpose and the expectation of x hidden once you basically compute this uh, uh, sufficient statistics you have to uh, go to the m step and uh, and there you have to basically find update the parameters so in the m step in this multivariate gaussian what do we have to do how does the what do we maximize this particular m step remember hidden and visible they give you the whole multivariate gaussian so what do we do in the m step we put them together and we have to find the mean and the variance that maximize this the likelihood all right given both the visible and the hidden and that problem is identical to what problem uh, for gaussian i mean i have a multivariate gaussian i tell you find the mean and the variance right and i give you all the values of x so how do you compute that Look, you know, if I give, if you have a Gaussian and I give you realizations of X, what is the most trivial way to find uh, estimates of the mean and the variance? MLE, right? So the MLE, the the, the um, you know the uh, empirical mean and the empirical variance will be the MLE estimates, all right? So here is the trick the uh, updates the m-step are your MLE equations the only difference is uh, when it comes to the expectations to, to the hidden variables you're going to use the uh, e e expected sufficient statistics that they were computed in the east step you understand so you're going to basically guess you're going to say this is my mean and this is my variance but when you expand this right for a multivariate gaussian this is for example what you're going to use for a mean this will be um, uh, the mean so you're going to use let's say the mean of the uh, visible variables uh, but this mi is what is that it is the expected value that we computed in the each step for the hidden variables given the visible variables okay so if you don't actually uh, update this with respect to the uh, the sufficient statistics in the east step and you go directly 
and start doing calculations, okay, like trying to maximize uh, this joint log likelihood, you're not going to go anywhere in, and you're going to get the wrong answers. Okay? So, uh, so the problem is basically in the E step, compute the posterior of the hidden variables given the visible, find the mean, find the variance, uh, and then uh, in the M step, uh, you can use your classical MLE equations, but uh, when you try to compute this uh, uh, sufficient statistics, you have to use the values that you estimated with the approximate posterior from the each step where the parameters were fixed at the previous value. And of course, you're going to iterate in this parameter. So this is a wonderful way to actually uh, compute you know, the parameters of uh, uh, high dimensional distributions uh, given data that are guppy. There's information missing. It's not that I gave you limited number of data, right? I also gave you uh, some data that have some uh, uh, components missing. Okay, so uh, so here's an example. Uh, I th yes, this is from Murphy's uh, uh, book, uh, so you can play with this. So we have 100 uh, uh, data sets from a 10-dimensional um, uh, Gaussian, and 50% of the data are missing. Not 1% or 2, 50% of the data are missing. And when I say missing, so I give you 100 realizations, and every realization, 50% of the uh, uh, data are missing. Uh, okay, so you know, it's 10 dimensions, so basically I don't give you the values for, let's say, the five components. So what uh, we need to do is we need to uh, uh, predict, basically, the, uh, uh, the parameters, uh, mean and, and variance, okay? And uh, let me try to understand what it is. So here is, um, um, can you guess from what, uh, what is plotted here? So here I see the computations with two parameters, and this is uh, imputation basically. So we fill in the gaps basically with their uh, uh, expected values that calculate when the EM algorithm converges. And uh, so this what gives you is the imputed values versus uh, the two values, all right, using the two parameters, okay? And this is uh, the same plots effectively using the parameters that we computed with here. Okay? So, um, and I believe uh, the same uh, algorithm, right, you can use it for um, a mixture of Gaussians with missing data, uh, you can uh, use it for student t distributions. There's a lot of uh, problems uh, in, uh, that come up in, uh, they don't come up just independently, right, but as a part of a bigger picture where you have to, uh, to uh, impute the data uh, uh, to do subsequent sort of uh, analysis. Okay, we don't want that. So let's see if I have time to... Uh, I have time only to define the problem. There's really nothing um, uh, new, so I just, I'm going to give you only, okay. So uh, let's uh, discuss in the five minutes left, right? Uh, so we talk about uh, Gaussians uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so let's discuss about uh, 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 a case where the observations basically uh, are uh, uh, discrete, in this case, uh, binary. So uh, in particular, what I'm interested in is to have a mixture of, uh, uh, of Bernoulli samples. So here's how uh, the, the problem looks like. Uh, uh, I remind you, basically, so you, you remember for a binary variable, all right, that can take the value x equal to 1 of 0 with probability x equal to 1 probability mu, uh, the Bernoulli distribution is mu to the power x, 1 minus mu to 1 minus x. But now I have uh, the Bernoulli variables, right? So my likelihood for one data point looks like that, where these are known parameters. Okay? So this is how uh, this uh, Bernoulli likelihood looks like. Now when you write something like this, 
uh, and you try to use it in practice, these variable sex are uncorrelated, okay? So if you try sort of to use this for, let's say, classification of images and things like that, uh, this is not gonna be very helpful because these variables have no correlation between them. So effectively, you're doing way too much calculation, but you don't capture uh, uh, any important information. So what we're gonna do is to be able to do this, we're gonna use a mixture of this uh, d-dimensional uh, Bernoulli uh, samples, and the mixture will look like this. So this is a, an identical equation to our Gaussian mixture, mixture coefficients. These are our mean vectors, but each of these distributions uh, is, uh, you know, this d-dimensional Bernoulli distribution. Okay? So I haven't done really anything, again, very much different except uh, change uh, the likelihood that looks uh, looks like that. So, um, okay. So basically, uh, the problem that I have in the notes and, and the program that go with it is to try, if I give you uh, uh, images of handwritten uh, uh, numbers, to try basically to uh, classify them to different groups. And in this case, for example, you know, I mean, I can see, uh, I give you, I don't know, this is one, uh, nine, nine, zero, and three, right? So uh, basically we would like to uh, uh, classify this to groups. Maybe uh, there is a group that has a mean, the letter, the number one, and number one that has uh, the letter two, etc. So that way uh, I can represent uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, any of these uh, letters, any of these numbers with my model. So anyways, there's a long discussion here, but if you do MLE, it doesn't work, okay? And there's many uh, reasons it doesn't work is, uh, for example, if you take this nine and this nine, if, is this a nine or a four? Nine. So if you take those two, it will take them as two completely different numbers, and it will actually give you two completely different clusters. So every time you take, change the orientation or you stretch it, it will interpret it uh, uh, as, a, as a different cluster, which means to be able to model these things, you really need a lot of clusters in your data. However, with uh, the uh, EM algorithm, you don't have that problem. Uh, the calculations, it's identical to the Gaussian mixture problem, okay? So uh, this is our complexity that we need to address, log of summation of this mixture. So what we do is uh, we write things, the likelihood for each data point and the prior like that. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, you, uh, this Z will be the responsibilities, okay? Uh, and we need to find the uh, expectations of those, which uh, these are the posterior responsibilities. So everything is identical uh, except uh, the algebra is a little bit uh, uh, different. So effectively, um, the, sufficient, the, the expected sufficient statistics that we need is uh, sort of, I think they're identical basically what you get in Gaussians in form, okay? So NK is the effective number of points in cluster K. Uh, you know, this is the mean uh, uh, of the points that uh, belong in the cluster K. This is how the responsibilities look like, like and this is uh, the expected value of the joint log likelihood. All right, so if you do all of this, and uh, you do the uh, calculations for the M step, okay? Um, uh, basically, uh, if you want, let's say, to take these letters and model uh, uh, a mixture with three Bernoulli, you know, a mixture of three Bernoulli distributions, okay? Uh, and somebody gives you data like this, all right? So if you take, this is letters of two, four, four, I suppose this is three, right, and four. So it comes up even with a mixture of three that the centers of this uh, uh, mixture components is two, four, and three, okay? If you only want to do it with one Bernoulli distribution, basically uh, it gives you uh, a three. Uh, notice these are binary images, right? So you're gonna pixelize them. That's why we need the d-dimensional Bernoulli distribution. So this would be, uh, you know, one or zero variables, but the calculations we do uh, because of the posterior responsibilities, you notice this will not give you black and white, it will be somewhere in between, 
right? Because the posterior responsibilities can be anywhere from zero to one. That's why you can uh, see that uh, uh, there is some deviation basically in, uh, in uh, the coloring of the, of the letters. So anyways, um, the rest is uh, in the notes. You guys can read it. Uh, I'm going to say only that uh, the, the M step, the way we present it, it's really uh, an MLE estimate for the joint log likelihood. Uh, what you should really do, because we're supposed to be doing Bayesian things, uh, if you add a prior for the parameters, you can define sort of uh, a map estimate. And uh, so in uh, the lecture notes, basically from Monday, you will see a lot of calculations where it's a map estimate for this. And uh, there are some examples where MLE estimates will be completely garbage, and you need to add uh, stabilization. Uh, and I think one of these problems uh, is with uh, uh, the mixture of Gaussians, where basically, uh, uh, depending on what data you have, the MLE estimate doesn't work. Okay. So uh, this is the example that you can read in the notes that demonstrates that uh, uh, the MLE estimate basically uh, fails. This is a fraction of times AM for Gaussian mixture 